What is genuine quantum information? Let's define it with a setup which is again very similar to the setup that um, we've already seen a couple of times now. So once again we have our familiar characters Alice and Bob. But now Alice no longer performs a classical random experiment. Rather, with a certain probability distribution, she produces various quantum states. And these have to be pure states. Yeah, so in the case of uh, that we discussed previously, transmission of classical information via a quantum channel, we allowed the coding states to be also mixed states, but here we require that these are pure states. Yeah, so Alice randomly creates these pure quantum states. You can imagine, for example, that Alice has a laser it's a very weak laser, it emits one photon after the other and the photons go through a polarization filter and Alice can rotate the polarization filter. There's a number of possible positions of the, of the polarization filter and with a certain probability distribution the polarization filter is in one of one of these definite settings and then with each photon emitted basically the polarization filter is rotated randomly in one of these positions and then after the filter you have a collection of photons in various pure polarization states with a certain probability distribution. These are also called the signal states. And now Alice wants to send to Bob these quantum states, these signal states, via a quantum channel using qubits. As in the classical setting, the probability distribution with which the various signal states are produced is given and is known also by Bob. What Bob does not know is the specific sequence of signal states produced on Alice's side. And he receives the qubits and decodes the qubits, we have yet to define what decode means, and then reconstructs the quantum states, the signal states. Now the, um, I talked about the example using photons, polarization states of photons, they, that's, that's again a qubit. So in that case, perhaps one could think of sending the photons directly. But think instead of hydrogen atoms and in whatever way uh, Alice produces hydrogen atoms in various excited states. Uh, so the hydrogen atom, that's not a qubit. Uh, so she cannot simply send the hydrogen atoms, but she has to somehow... Uh, couple the hydrogen, hydrogen atoms to qubits and then send, she's only allowed to send qubits to Bob and then Bob somehow has to translate that back into, has to reconstruct somehow the um, excited hydrogen states on his side. Now let's talk more specifically about this encoding and decoding. In the setting where uh, we already had a quantum channel but we wanted to uh, 
convey classical information, we said that Alice prepares coding states and Bob measures these coding states or performs measurements on these coding states. Here I wrote encode and decode rather than prepare and measure. And in fact, here it's something different. The encoding and the decoding are unitary transformations. Yeah? So there's no preparation going on of the qubits and there's also no measurement going on on the qubits, but you really, you have on Alice's side, you have the signal states and then she performs a unitary transformation on the joint Hilbert space of the uh, systems which carry the signal states and the qubits which she uses to encode the, these quantum states. And then she sends the qubits and Bob um, also has on his side physical systems um, whose states uh, or the physical systems whose states he wants to reconstruct. Yeah, and he receives the qubits from Alice and then he performs a unitary transformation on the joint Hilbert space of the qubits and the physical systems um, whose quantum states he wants to reconstruct on his side. Yeah? So various important differences to the setup um, where we conveyed classical information. Yeah? We have no longer a classical random experiment, but we have random generation of signal states. These are pure quantum states. We no longer have preparation and measurement, but we have unitary transformations. To make it a little bit more precise, uh, even mathematically, the when Alice generates these signal states, uh, one after the other, then all the signal states together, or all the physical systems in these signal states together, they are in a pure state in in the compass in the composite Hilbert space, and this is a pure product state. It's the it's the tensor product of the individual signal states, and the order is relevant. Yeah? Just as in the case of a classical random experiment, Alice wants to convey to Bob not only the results and how often they occurred, but also the order, the specific order in which they occurred. And the same is true here. Yeah? So this, the systems together are in a tensor product state and the order is relevant, is important here. So we can phrase the problem also in this way that we say Alice has on her side this tensor, this pure tensor product state and the individual factors in this tensor product are taken from a set of possible signal states which occur with a certain probability distribution and it's this tensor product state that she wants to um, convey to Bob and which Bob at his end wants to reconstruct. Yeah, so at the end he also wants to have an, an n-partite, a composite quantum system in that tensor product state. And the way Alice does that is that is via a unitary transformation uh, that somehow maps this state onto a state of qubits which she sends to Bob and Bob does another unitary transformation which maps the qubit state then onto the physical systems that are supposed to have this tensor product state. So that's the, that's the setup and in this setup we define 
quantum information as the average number of qubits that Alice has to send per signal state that she generates. And so uh, it's a definition that that's completely analogous to the definition of classical information of the Shannon entropy. Yeah? You look at the number of qubits assuming optimal compression that Alice needs in order to send to Bob the in the to convey to Bob the entire tensor product state which consists of n factors and you divide by the number of factors by n so the so that's the average number of qubits needed for each factor in this tensor product state uh, for each signal state and this is defined as the von Neumann it's named after John von Neumann it's called the von Neumann entropy and that is our measure of quantum information and the formula that you find for the von Neumann entropy using a logic that's again analogous to the classical case uh, to the derivation of the Shannon entropy depends only on the mixture of the, si of the signal states yeah? so you have the, the various signal states psi i if you express them not as cats but as statistical operators then the statistical operator corresponding to a signal state is a projector onto that signal state so it's this dyad psi i psi i yeah that's the this this is a projector and it's the statistical operator corresponding to one particular signal state and if you take the weighted average of these statistical operators of these states then you get a statistical operator rho and that is now a mixed state and the von Neumann entropy is a function of that mixed state only that's a first interesting insight because it tells us that the the quantum information does not really depend on your specific choice of signal states yeah? you, you can have many different choices of signal states which give the same mixture yeah? when you take the weighted average they give the same row and they all have then the same von Neumann entropy yeah? it depends only on that mixture and now um, the function of rho has this form it's minus the trace of rho log rho and let this that looks again very similar to the classical case for the Shannon entropy we had minus the sum of rai pi log pi and now instead of the sum we have the trace and instead of the pi's we have the statistical operator rho in fact if you write this rho in uh, spectral decomposition so you look at the you diagonalize the rho and then you have the diagonal elements rho i and then in this basis where the rho is diagonal the trace actually becomes um, sum of rho rho i log rho i and it looks exactly like the classical Shannon entropy so there, there are a lot of formal similarities with the Shannon entropy but you should bear in mind that the physical meaning is is very different yeah, there's a very, it's a different setup behind the definition yeah, here we have 
quantum states that we want to transmit via a quantum channel using qubits. And in the classical case, we had a classical random experiment, which we wanted to transmit using classical bits. And it's striking, uh, however, that the um, that the entropy that you get as a result is formally so similar to the classical entropy. The derivation of the formula for the von Neumann entropy is not so trivial, actually. Yeah? And I'm skipping this here. I said the basic idea is similar to the classical case. In the classical case, we talked about the so-called typical sequences. We exploited the law of, law of large numbers. The fact that when you have very many trials, then um, you can be almost certain that the sequence of outcomes is, is a typical sequence. And we exploited that, that fact. Here you can make a similar argument. You then no longer have a typical sequence, but a so-called typical subspace of your Hilbert space, of your composite Hilbert space. However, the argument is a little bit more complicated because you have to take into account the possibility that the signal states are not orthogonal. Now, this is not required. The signal states can be arbitrary superposition states. Yeah, thinking of your of the photon polarization example, yeah, the the setting of your polarizer, these this can be arbitrary angles. So the polarization states that you get are not necessarily orthogonal. And so th the fact that the signal states need not be orthogonal, this this complicates a little bit the, the derivation of the phenomenon entropy.